uh, that were similar. I wanted to go over more problems that were similar to what will be on the on the final exam uh, for tomorrow. You'll be dealing with probably static methods, maybe an instance method on linked lists, and then a, then you know a static method on trees, right? So um, just review. So that's what's going to be on your time lab, but there'll be problems that are similar to what will be on the final exam. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, that sounds like a decent question, actually. Yeah, so they should be static methods. Um, and I'll probably put some kind of uh, some caveats about what the time should be like for each of those methods, but that should be fairly straightforward. All right, so this exam, let's see, over here, not the one I wanted. Um, so this one from University of Washington has got a fairly decent section that I really, really liked. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so not question one, but question two. So in this course, we've seen many different data structures including, and this is actually uh, like a lot of the stuff we, this is like the same stuff we've went over, a uh, list, either a linked list or an array list, a 2D array, a stack, a queue, a hash table, which is used for sets of maps, a tree, binary search tree, undirected graph, a directed graph, and a directed acyclic graph, right? Directed graphs that have no cycles, right? So for each of the following applications, can indicate which of these data structures would be most suitable and then give a brief justification for your choice. Most suitable because technically you can store everything in an array in an array. It just may not be the most suitable or useful thing to do. For, um, for data structures like trees and graphs, describe what, you know, uh, what information is stored on the vertices and edges. And if the edges are weighted, describe what information is stored in the weights. Okay. So let's get started with that. Um, first one, the map of the Puget Sound Highway System used to display travel t uh, traffic travel times on a web page. The map displays the principal cities, the intersections, and the major landmarks, the roads that connect them, and the travel time between, these uh, between them along these roads. Travel times along the same road may be different in different directions. So what data structure do we use to, to basically store this entire uh, thing. Yeah, I heard that. Weighted directed graph? Yeah, a weighted directed graph. I heard graph. Specifically what we want is a uh, directed graph that has weights. All right, so in that case, what are the vertices in this graph? Yeah, they're locations. They're the cities, the intersections, those major landmarks, right? Those are vertices, things to get to, okay? Edges? You have roads, the way you get between them. And what is, and then the weights are what? Travel time, right? How long it's going to take from one, to, uh, from one edge to another. <laughs> All right, so that wasn't so bad, even though it looked really complicated. But you can see how that kind of just easily parses into a graph. A chess board. An 8x8 board used for a game of chess. Each square on the board is empty or contains a chess piece. So which of those data structures that were listed above? For a chessboard, eight by eight chessboard, a two D array like we did in our uh, in our in our class uh, for our homework, right? We could do a two D array of characters for like you know you know have a dash for unoccupied space and then have a letter for each piece. A computer model showing the dependencies between the steps needed to assemble a B seven eighty seven airplane at Bover uh, Boeing's Everett plant. This one may be a bit trickier. So it's dependencies between different steps. Some kind of graph? Yep. One of the, so what, which of these graphs is useful for dependencies? S specific type of directed. A de directed acyclic graph is useful for dependencies, right? Um, I mean, that's like, so say I want, I'm, I'm trying to install, um, so let's see, sudo apt install Eclipse, right? I want to install Eclipse, but I can't just install Eclipse. I actually need a lot more stuff, um, right? It's going to tell, say, get package information. It's going to build this dependency graph and say, hey, to install Eclipse, you need 
the Eclipse JD Tay, you need uh, Eclipse PDE, you need the Eclipse platform, you need the Eclipse platform data, and those things will require different libraries, and those libraries might require different libraries, right? So, say, so it builds this dependency graph of what of what I need to have installed before I can install Eclipse. If I don't have these things, then Eclipse won't have the data to run. So, um, all right, let's see a list of the legal words in a Scrabble game. Copyright, registered, trademarked. Um, we, we want to be able to quickly check whether, these whether the words used by players do in fact exist in the list, right? Whether or not those, those words are in fact legal. So what data structure? And what data structure? We want to check things uh, to see if these words actually exist. Right now, it did use the word list, so that kind of, which is a terrible choice on the author's part, because uh, actually, list is not the structure I would use, right? Because with a list, I'd have to iterate through it to find it, right? So if I want to just instantly check whether a, a word is valid, what would I want to check? Hash table. Hash table. Yeah, use a set, use a set to instantly check it, or use an array list and use binary search to find it, but. Uh, if you want to be space efficient, but if you care about, you know, looking something up really quickly, we want to use uh, the uh, set to do so. Um, describe description of the inheritance relationships between different cl between classes and interfaces in a Java program. Important thing to remember: uh, if you're a class in Java, yeah, is a tree. How many how many possible parents can you have? How many parent classes can you have? You extend one parent. You can only inherit from one parent. You can implement a lot of interfaces, but you can only extend one parent. So that makes it a very, but a lot, but a lot of people can extend you. So that makes it a very nice hierarchical tree, right? Um, I suppose you could also say a directed acyclic graph because technically a trees are directed acyclic graphs. If you wanted to make sure you were ca catching the interfaces as well. Um, now this one's interesting because we can debate about this one. There's lots of correct answers for this one, I feel. Uh, the history list recording sites visited by a user of a web browser. As new sites are visited, they are added to the list. The list also supports the operation of going back to the web page that was previously visited before the current page and going forward to the next page visited. So, right, the, in other words, a data structure to implement the functionality of these two buttons up here, right? Hitting forward to go forward and back to go back. Yes. Doubly linked list. A doubly linked list would per, would work perfectly here, being able to go uh, backwards and forwards, right? And then uh, you can kind of make these grayed out based on whether you're at the head or the tail of the list, right? Um, I would also accept two stacks, right? Like I said, um, but a doubly linked list is really what we want there. Um, So those are all, all those. Um, now there was one particular one that I was also very fond of over here. Um, this problem over here, um, oh, I'm sorry, on a different graph. But since, yeah. Now this one's a pretty fun one. Um, so you are given a text file containing a week's worth of login duration for users on the eludra.usc.edu server. Each line of the text file corresponds to a single login session. A line will contain the user's ID, for example, Cheng W, followed by a space character, followed by the user's login duration in seconds, for example, 314.326 uh, seconds for that login session. Your job is to compute and print out the average login duration for the user. In other words, you add up the durations uh, of the total amount of time the user was logged in for and divide it by the number of times they logged in for each user. <coughs> for example, if you contain two login sessions for Cheng W, one for 314.326 seconds and one for 204.7, then Cheng W259513 should appear in your output exactly once right, because that's the average of those two times. The input file is unordered, 
So in other words, one user can come before any other user, right? And you may assume that the, that the input file is well formatted so you don't have to validate the program. That means that we can just always assume that basically that we can correctly parse the file. We don't have to like check for errors in the file. Okay. Um, your output does not need to be sorted. Please write a partial C++ program. We'll do it in Java. Whoops. Page width. Uh, to perform the task. You, must, you may assume the correct header files. In other words, they, they imported the right things. Uh, you, in order to receive any credit, you must use standard library maps, one to store the sum of the durations for each user and one to store the, number, the total number of login sessions. So I like this question because it's a map question and it's also one that basically uh, a user would definitely have, it's something that some developer or sysadmin definitely had to write at some point. Um, which is that figuring out the average that uh, amount of time each person was logged in per session. So, um, and I also like this one because it's utterly ridiculous to put on a final exam because it requires a lot of, a number of parts. Mainly you have to read in a file, but that's not too bad. So let's go ahead and solve this one. Uh, public, static, um, and we'll go ahead and return our answer as a map. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, string and double. Uh, why is this? Because the file, wh uh, what is our output going to be? We want our outputs to be, for each user, we want to have the amount of time, they, the, the average amount of time each user was logged in, right? So key, user, value, t uh, the average amount of time they were logged in. Um, get averages, right? And we'll go ahead and assume that we're taking in the file name. Uh, the file. Now this is one more thing, I, one thing over here that I wouldn't expect you to do on any exam, especially since you're not going to be do file, uh, doing any file reading. I'm going to do a throws exception over here so I don't have to put uh, a try catch block in my code, right? That will just simply warn anybody who calls this method that you need to put this method in a try catch block because it's going to generate, it can potentially generate an error and I'm not handling the error for you. So. Um, but generally you should do a try catch block, but since this is, I want to make this as nice as possible, right? Now, they gave us two maps to use. A map from string to doubles, that was the duration sum, and a map of string to ints for the count. So in other words, I'll give those new names. So map string to double. We'll go ahead and put that down as uh, login times is equal to new hash map and map string integer um, logging counts is equal to a new hash map. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to be going through the file and collecting two pieces of data for each, uh, for each user the total amount of time that that user logged in for, login times, and the total number of times they logged in, right? The amount of time they were logged in for total and the amount of time they logged in, right? That way I can go to each user and just kind of match it up and say, okay, your login time divided by your login count is equal to your average login, right? And I suppose I'll go ahead and create my output, uh, map string double averages is equal to a new hash map. All right, I could easily just print it out, but I'm just going to go ahead and return that, and I'll put return averages down here, and I'll let the user figure out how they want to handle the R map. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is read the file and get all this information. Now, right, if you don't use a map, then it's kind of a nightmare because you have to read through that file probably multiple times and then or you have to remember oh did I see this user already and that kind of turns into a nightmare because you have to recheck lists and stuff so it, it's much easier if you use a map and we just do l this line by line so let's go ahead and make our new scanner 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 is equal to new scanner that reads a file object with the with the uh, following file name Right, and normally this would be in a try catch block, but because I put a throws exception here, I don't need to put it in a try catch block. 
Okay, and now we need to read the file, which is actually very easy to do. I'm going to read it line by line because that's the way I prefer to do things and because our data is stored line by line. Then once I have an individual line, I'll figure out how to break it apart. So while a scanner dot has next line, I'm going to read that line. So string line is equal to a scanner dot next line. So that allows me to read my lines one at a time, right? And just then I can do what with each line as I wish. Um, rather than doing dot next, which would only read a chunk at a time, and then I'd have to remember what chunk I'm reading. Right? That's that's a bit more frustrating. So string line is equal to scanner next line. Now what am I going to do? Well, I need well that line is breaking as is broken up into three parts. It's the username, space, time they lo spent logged in. So I can use the split method to break that apart. Uh, string parts is equal to line dot split over a space. We know that there's going to be a single space. We're guaranteed that there's going to be a single space to split on. And so this will create an array of size two. So this will split each uh, line into an array of size two. Index zero is going to hold the username. Index one is going to hold the login time. So let's go ahead. String user is equal to line zero. Sorry, not line zero, uh, but parts zero. Oh, right. Minor mistake here. There we go. It's an array. Parts zero. String uh, time is equal to, except that except the time should be a double really. So we'll do double time is equal to double dot parse double um, parts one. So we take the numbers stored as a string in part one. And just like there's an integer dot parse int, right, there's a double dot parse double, right, which will turn any string into a double, uh, provided that it's actually a double value. So we get there, so we have the username, and now we have the time, okay? So we've got a specific username, we've got their time, and now we just gotta put it into our maps now. Okay, and now I'm gonna take advantage of something, uh, which it, it may not have been apparently obvious, but it's always true. Um, if a key exists in one of these data structures, then if the key exists in one of these maps, then it exists in both of these maps. If it if it doesn't exist in one, it doesn't exist in both, right? You can't have logged in. You can't have a login count without having an a, lo a login time, right? That makes sense. So let's go ahead and so all I have to do is just check one. So if login times dot contains key. Um, user. So in other words, if the user has, a, has logged in for any duration of time, that means they've logged in at least once, right? Um, right so if we've already seen them, then, all, then and you can either do the not first or you can do this, either, it doesn't matter which order you do it in, but since I programmed it like this, if login times that contains user, so if we've seen the user before, if they've already, if we've already seen that they've logged in, well, we'll do login times dot put user and then what we're going to do is that we're going to get their previous login time and add time to that right so that might so that's just I, I, I just simply did this at one line rather than doing it in a bunch of lines what I do is I I, I replace their the amount of time that's stored in there with the amount of time that's stored in there plus the amount of time that they've uh, that they uh, that they uh, were logged in for for this session and then we do login and then we do the same thing over here login ca uh, counts dot put user login counts dot get the number of times they've already logged in and add one to that if we haven't seen them before then we do something very similar, which is that we do an, we still do put, put operation for both. It's just 
we do instead the much simpler, oh, well, we haven't seen them before. Well, this is the amount of time they've logged in for, which is one, which is whatever that line said. And here's the number of times they've logged in, which is one. Right? So we've went ahead and we've populated the um, uh, this data structure now. So we've got the number. So, so this is part of the reason I don't wouldn't actually give this some actual exam because it does take a lot of lines to do. Um, so, let's see. Now we got to actually compute the averages, which isn't too bad. We do a for loop for each string user in. It doesn't matter if we do login counts or login time. For each user in login counts dot, and then we need, I think, a dot key set. For every user in login counts dot key set. All right, so for every user that we found a login time for, um, averages dot put. Their average is equal to user login times dot get the user divided by login counts for the user. Dot. And that will calculate the login average amount. Right, so we get the login amount of time that user logged in for and the amount of times they logged in. And we divide one by the, by the, the first by the second. And that calculates the amount of time that the user logged in. And so now we can return the averages. If we didn't need to return something but instead needed to print it out, we could just do a print line statement there, right? But it's much easier for me to just do that. So. That's that problem solved. Um, and now, if you're taking the common, if you're if you're taking the common final, then like a question like this will not be on on there. But if you t have to do a makeup or an alternate final, there will be questions like this. So, you know. So that's why I bothered going over it because it, it might be it, you know most of you won't have to encounter a problem with that, but depending on your needs to rearrange a final. By the way, does everybody know what the policy is if you have more than three finals in a day? One of them has to move. Um, yeah, well, well, okay, so, the, pol so the, the student handbook wording is that you, um, is that one of those professors has to move and accommodate, for, you know, professors are recommended to make accommodations for students who have more than two finals. If one of your professors isn't moving, escalate. If, if you can't get any of those three professors to move, and by default it should be that m the professor in the m with the m exam in the middle, if one of them's not moving, then escalate. Are you referring to the new file on Slack earlier? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can't condone it, but I would understand it. <laughs> no, don't definitely definitely do not use violence. I would say that that's like escalate like to a to, to dean of student affairs or something like that, or assistant or some of the assistant dean, or to, you know, but basically, you know, the deans exist for a reason, um, and and having and taking and, and not taking more than two finals in a, in a day is what we consider a very reasonable request. Although some people don't say that, so please let me know if if that happens with our exam, and we can and I can easily rearrange, and the sooner you let me know the better because then I can basically get as many people in a single session at once, right? So that, that will help. Um, but, you know, just let me know. And again, if like you get in a car accident like right before you're headed to the final, let me know as soon as possible, right? You know, because I don't want you to, I don't want you to like uh, fail or something, you know, so. All right. So let's go over some um, other questions in this final. Um, what is the organizational property obeyed by all nodes in a binary search tree? I.e., what is the binary search tree property? 
you can assume that all values in a binary search tree are unique for this. So what is the binary search tree property? Yes? Yes, yes, that, that, is, that is informally correct. So then, <laughs> um, the, the, but yeah, that, that's correct. That uh, we can, the formal definition is like you can take a set, uh, a tree is a set of nodes, a, a tree or subtree is a set of nodes that can be split into three distinct sets, the left, so the right, and the root, and everything in the left is less than the root, right? right. But the important thing is that everything, to the, that everything to the left of the root is less, everything to the greater, so that the, that to the right comes after the root, and that the pro and that everything to the left and everything to the right are also trees, are also binary search trees that also follow this property, right? It's that it's the and it's recursive as well. That's also very important. All right. So let the, so this one's a bit of an obtuse way, but let's see if we can't uh, putting it. But we can let's see if you can't. Uh, Parse it. Let the key of a node in a binary search tree be x. Let's also call this node node x. Node 2, please give a definition of the predecessor of x. Uh, what, what do they mean by that? Given that you are at node x and node x has two children, how do you find predecessor x by traversing the children? So what do you think they mean by, so what do they mean by predecessor? They don't mean your parent here. What is your predecessor of, what is the predecessor of node x? Something we use in one of our methods for a tree. So predecessor is ne is the in order predecessor here is what they're in case there's any ambiguity. I call it the in order predecessor to be very specific about it. But what is the in order predecessor? Yes. That is the answer to part two, which is how you find it, right? That is the answer to part two, which is how you find it. The biggest thing smaller, right? It is the biggest thing that is smaller than x. It is the, big, it is the, biggest, uh, it is the biggest node that is smaller than x, right? Or rather, the biggest value that is smaller than x. Yes? Could you also go right and then go all the way left? Go right and all the way. Well, that goes down to part C, because that doesn't give you your predecessor. That gives you your successor, right? Which is the smallest thing that is bigger, right? If you go one to the right, you're in this tree of stuff that is bigger. Then if you go all the way to the left, you're gonna get the smallest thing that is bigger than you, which is your next in order successor. Yeah. So why is it sometimes better to use a red-black tree or ABL tree? What kind of trees are though, by, by the way? Yes. They are self-balancing binary search trees, right? We didn't really go over them to then, other than to say they exist, right? Such things exist. Um, so why would we want to use those things instead of a normal binary search uh, tree? Yeah. Because the worst case would be like a line. Yeah, the worst case binary search tree is like a, a line, which basically results in a linked list, essentially, right? So the worst case lookup time in a binary search tree is O of n, but for self-balancing binary search trees, they remain balanced, which means that the best case scenario is, sorry, the, the worst case scenario is log n time. Now granted, you, it, they might have to do log n to insert and then another log in, lo, log n to rebalance, but that's still better than the worst case of O of n. All right, so let's see. We went over this question last time, essentially, but like with bad hash functions. Un so we went over this one already. What un under what conditions would you prefer using an adjacency list to represent a graph over an adjacency matrix? Please list two such conditions. So we have one condition which we know, which is what? Yes? How full the graph is. How full the graph is, the sparseness or denseness of a graph, right? So if a graph is full, uh, so basically if it's more than 25% of, uh, in other, if more than 25% of the possible edges existed, we consider that a dense graph and we want to use an adjacency matrix. Otherwise, use an adjacency list. There's another condition though that, and that has to do with a lookup time. So that is that basically it's very easy to check if an edge exists. You can check 
in if an edge exists in constant time in a, in a adjacency matrix, right? You just simply have to look. Is there a what is the value for you know row A column D, right? To see if there's an so to see if there is an edge between in A and D, you just have to check row A column D, and that's a constant time check because you're looking at a matrix. On the other hand, for an adjacency list to check if the edge exists, you have to iterate through all through the entirety of A's adjacency list, right? You have to look at all the list of all the stuff that A is adjacent to. So the adjacency list if matrix is great if you're trying to look for like look up a single thing, a single edge, or just looking up random edges in general. All right. Um, let's see. And this one. Pre-order, in order, we've already done that. I'm just trying to look for something that would be a bit more. So here they have rotations. Do, 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 do. OK, they're showing. So let's see what this one is. Balance factor. No. Right, this exams in C++. Um, so traversing a binary search tree. So um, what would be the output of this tree if we are doing a pre-order traversal of a tree, just to review this? So pre-order is root, then left, then right. So it would be A. We'd start with A, then we'd go to the left. It would be B, then D, then E, then H, then C, then F, then G, J, then G, then K. On the other hand, a post order is a, sorry, an in order is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's root, then left. Sorry, it's left, then root, then right. So here for in order, we would say left, left, we'd go D, B, H, E, A, then go to the right. Do this side, which is blank, F, J, C, K, G, which is a bit weird to do when the stuff isn't actually in order, right, in the tree. So that's a bit of a trick. The post order is act, and the post order finally is to do is what? We go, we start the root, and we do left tree, then right tree, then root. So we'll do our left tree, we'll do our left tree, D, do our right tree, H, E, B, do our right tree, do our left tree, do our right tree, J, F, G, not G yet, K, G, C, A, for that one. So let's see, insertion, rotation, deletion. Sorry, quick question. Are we going to have to do uh, rotation on these things? No. Okay. No. Um, it's going to be more standard like the problems on exam uh, that were on the second exam, so similar, something similar to that. Um, let's see. Now let's go back to this one over here. All right. So, all right. Here we go. Here's the kind of question I would would definitely ask on the exam if I were not giving it to you. Um, imagine, so here we have a binary search tree that's defined by this. Uh, complete the tree definition for, of the method BFS to perform a breadth first traversal of the binary tree and print out the data node values in the order they are reached during the search. In your solution, you may create and use, what inst uh, use instances of what other data structures, lists, queues, stacks, trees, hash tables, graphs, or whatever, in their operation if they are useful without having to give detail about how they're implemented. In other words, if the data structure exists in the standard library, you can use it, right? If it's a data structure we've learned, you can use it. If it's a data structure I haven't learned, you know, we haven't learned, but you know, but it's a real thing, you can use it, right? And that's kind of key here, especially on the exam. You can, if you're like, man, if I can, this would be easy if I had access to this data structure. Well, then use that bloody data structure, right? So let's go ahead. So we want to do a breadth first uh, traversal of of a binary search, sorry, of a binary tree, which would be 
if going back to this previous one, if we were doing a uh, a breath first search, also known or sorry, breath first traversal, also called a level order traversal of this tree, we would do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, right? We basically do level one, then level two, then level three, then level four. So how that one going to work? Well, I'm going to go ahead and just use since we're using nodes, I'm going to go ahead and just use a assume we're dealing with a you know, the public vo uh, void, sorry, public static void BFS. I'm going to just put node. Node of E tree. It should be basically a public static E. Now, on the exam, you probably, I'm, I don't use generics because the other class. That the, the, sorry, the other sections, they don't necessarily teach generics. And you may have noticed that a lot of exams don't actually have generics on them because reasons. I, I've thought, I think it's important to be able, that you know what generics are, but you know. Um, and I don't want the first time you experience them is to be in the corporate world, right? And they'll be like, why haven't you learned this? It's because, I don't know, generic, because your professor couldn't take the one or two lessons it took to teach it to you. Um, so, all right. So here we want to do a breadth first search. We're starting at the root of this binary of this tree. Now, unlike other ones, I'm saying we're starting at the root of a tree, not the tree or subtree, because we're not going to use recursion here. Breadth first search is be way better. We don't that recursion is not going to help us here. Instead, we're just going to do it like we would a graph, where we have a set of e um, identified which is a really big word, so I'm just going to shorten that to scene, which is just simply, that's the set of nodes that um, I've already seen, and I don't want to, uh, and I don't want to double add them, right? Um, we're also going to do our, I'm also going to create a list E output, which is the order in which I visit stuff. So new, um, we can do a linked list here, or an array list. It, this is one of those cases where it literally does not matter. Um, and then, of course, the thing that makes this actually work, a queue, uh, E, which we could call to do, or we could call, uh, we could call it to do, or we could just call it queue, right? Data you know, this is like the one instance where I'm, I'm totally okay with you using a single variable, you know, a single letter for a variable because it's extremely, it's an extremely expressive letter there. Um, now, the interesting thing here is because is this is fine if you did like new Q, if you did this on an exam, whatever. But it's wrong, okay? You're not, I, I'm not going to penalize you, but it's wrong on an exam. Oh, sorry, it's, it's wrong in real life, not on the exam, because technically Q is an interface. So it should be a linked list, right? A link, uh, a queue is implemented by a linked list, right? But whatever. Okay, so now we've got our, um, we've got, we're going to do Q dot, and if you forget the terms, I because I sometimes forget them. Well, that's why it's open note, but it's um, and open book. Um, so uh, offer, we're going to offer the root to the queue. That enqueues it into the root. And now, wow, so now here's the, the loop. So here's the actual problem solving part. Uh, while the queue dot is empty, while queue is empty is false, so while the queue is not empty, while there's still stuff in the queue, on uh, node e current is equal to queue dot Pole to get the thing, so we get the current node that we're visiting out of the queue like that. Um, right. And so while current is empty, queue dot pole. Um, so then we're going to output dot add current. Or current dot item technically. Technically, it's a queue of. Let's see. Offer. Yeah, yeah. My bad. So I'll put root dot item because it's a no, it's a queue of e's, not a queue of nodes. So, boom. 
boom. Yep, even I make mistakes. The key is being able to identify your mistakes, right? So I'm going to get out the item. I'm going to add it to my output. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my children. Um, so um, if, so if, ooh, OK. So this, is, so this is interesting because I'm realizing I'm making mistakes here, uh, which is that I can't, actually, if I'm getting the item, I can't get my children. So it does need to be a nodey here, right? Probably hate me for going back and forth like that. So this needs to be a queue of nodes of E. So now we can get it. Now we can add the item to the output. And if um, current.left is not equal to null, and then you might think, oh, I need to check if I've seen it before. Well, actually, everything in a, in a tree, right, if it's a tree, you only have one parent. So there's only one, ever one way to get to a, no, to a node. So you actually don't need this scene set over here like you would in a graph. So you don't need this. So if I have, so if I have a left child, q.offer current.left. Else, sorry, sorry, and then not else, but if current dot right is not equal to null. So if I have a right child, q dot q dot offer current dot right. So offer the let's call, fix this over here. Offer root. And then that's it. Now we just have to output everything, which we'll do by just simply saying system.out.println.output, output, which will print everything out for us because it's a list. And that will print out the order in which we visit stuff. So it's a fairly straightforward algorithm, right? I didn't even need a lot of the stuff that I would normally need in a graph because it's not a graph. So I don't need to worry about double checking any nodes because I can't get back up to my, the person who called me. OK. So let's see. Yeah. So that was that problem. All right. Here is an adjacency list uh, representation of a directed graph. No way. Unweighted directed graph. A, B, C, right? A has B, C, and E, has edges to B, C, and E. So that B, C, and D. B has an edge to A. C has an edge to B and D. And D has no edges. Draw a picture of the directed graph that has the above adjacency list representation. So in other words, convert, actually physically draw this like a human would like to see it. That's not too bad because Fortunately for us, we know exactly what nodes exist, right? It tells us A, B, C, and D. Okay, well, so let's just put them down. A, B, C, D is probably going to be a mess. Put them wherever you need to or wherever you want to. You could even put them in a line, right? The physical layout does not matter. So now we know that A has directed edges to B, C, and D. Okay, B has a directed edge to A, C has a directed edge to B and D, so, so C has a directed edge there, C has a directed edge there, and then D has no edges that le has no edges, right, anywhere. Right, and I know that, there, that these are one-way edges because it told me it's a directed graph, whoops. Right? So that's the way that graph would look. Might ask you to draw a graph on the exam. Right? So let's go ahead and look at the next part of this, though.
which is also a very important part. Another way to represent the graph is an adjacency matrix. Draw the adjacency matrix for <coughs> the for this graph. I would rather say like create the adjacency matrix because you're not really drawing because an adjacency matrix is a table, right? I mean, do you draw matrices? I don't know. Hmm. Was I supposed to like embroider the the sides and the lines of the of a matrix this entire time and I didn't know that? A B C D Okay, and divide, so there we go, right? And just remember the rows are the twos, sorry, the froms, sorry, sorry, the rows are our source, the columns are our destination, you know, from two, you know. So now we just need to put these, the, these values in here. So we'll put a one wherever there's an edge, and we'll just leave it blank wherever there's not an edge. So there's an edge from A to B, C, and D. There's an edge from B to A. There's an edge from C to B and D. And no edges to a D. Technically, these blanks should be zeros, but I mean, that's a lot of work drawing circles. So, um, and, and often of times, just for the sake of readability, we'll leave it blank when we actually draw it, just so that's easier to read. So Dijkstra's uh, algorithm problem that we went over yesterday was kind of meh. This is a bit much better, Dijkstra's uh, algorithm a graph. So consider the following directed graph. It's also a good example as to why I hate using uh, numbers for matrices, sorry, numbers for, for nodes, because when we have edges, it gets, sorry, when we have edges that have weights, it kind of gets confusing. So you want to use Dijkstra's algorithm to determine the shortest path from one to each of the other vertices. <coughs> so update the entries in the table below, right? Diff vertice uh, D to the pre its predecessor, and update it as the algorithm progresses. Cross out your old entries. I won't bother doing that, but that's fairly easy to figure out. Once you update it, you just cross out your old value and put your new da value down rather than erasing. And they gave you plenty of space to do that. Um, and rather than doing it on the board and jumping back and forth, I'm just going to create a, um, I'll just simply put that over here, right? So let's go ahead and, can I close the sidebar? Yeah, doesn't that really matter? Okay, so let's go ahead and see. So for Dijkstra's algorithm, what do we use? We have a set of the nodes that are done, the set of nodes to do. We have, and then we have uh, the node, the distance to that node, and the predecessor of that node, right? And we're starting from one, so we know uh, one is is done, and then for all the other nodes, we need their you know to figure out the distances. Node one, two, three, four, five, six. Now normally I don't. Now normally I don't. Uh, you know. Label. Normally I don't bother labeling. The node over here. Normal. Normally I don't like uh, bother keeping one in because that doesn't get updated, right? So I'm just going ahead and remove that. But they, but everybody kind of does Dijkstra's algorithm slightly differently. So let's figure out our initial distances. Okay, so one has edges between two and four, right? So let's go ahead and see what is the so one to two has a cost of two, and we got there from node one. Node three, you can't get there directly from node one, so we our initial cost is infinity from one. Node four has a cost of three, and we get there from node one. Node five has a cost of infinity because we can't get there directly, get there from one. And then finally, node six has a cost of infinity as well from one. 
Okay, so there's our graph and our shortest distances. So here's our, so here's the question now. Um, realize I could just do this, really me. All right, so now let's look, and so now let's run Dijkstra's algorithm. So let's look at all the nodes, which has the short, which have we figured out the shortest distance to? We figured out the shortest distance to two, so we'll move two to done. And now we'll look at two and basically relax the distances that, that we learned from two. So we get all the distances. Uh, so basically we look at the new edges and see what, uh, how that updates stuff. So two has an edge from two to five. And the cost to get to there is three plus the cost it was to get to two. So that's two plus three. Is that less than or equal to the cost? Is that less than the cost it currently gets to the cost it currently takes to get to five? Well, the cost it currently takes to get to five is infinity, so that, yeah, that's less. So we'll go ahead and say we can get to five for a cost of five, and we do that by going through new, node two. Okay. Okay, and how do we get to node two? Well, we get there from node one. Okay. Now let's look at this other edge. Its cost is, two, is five, the cost to get to three is five plus the cost it would take to get to two. So that's a grand total of seven, and that's also less than infinity, as it turns out. And so that has a cost of so that so we put down we can get to three for a cost of total cost of seven by going through two. Okay, so we're done there. So now let's look at these other distances. We've got two, but we've already done that. We have seven, one. Sorry, we have seven, three, and five. Three is the cheapest cost. So let's go to uh, to so let's. Go ahead and go with node four. Okay. So node four, it has one edge coming out, which has a cost of one. So it says the cost to get to three is one plus the cost to get to four, which is three. So one plus three, so it's a total cost of four. Is four less than what the current cost is? Yes, it is. So we update. We can get to node three by going through new, node four. That's a much better path. Okay, that was the only node there, so let's go ahead and look. Three has a cost of four, five has a cost of five, infinity has, sorry, and six has a cost of infinity. Uh, node three is as the cheapest cost. Okay, so move it out to done, and let's look at the new edges node three brings to us. So three has an edge to six, its total cost, so the cost to get to six is two, plus the cost it took to get to three. How did we get to three? By going this way, which was the total cost of four. So two plus what value is over here, which is six. So it costs six to get to six by going through three. And so how do we get to six? So, so the way, so again, I get what the information stored in the graph tells us is that the cost to get to six is six. You go through three, you get to three by going through four, four, you get the four by going through one, and you and one's the starting point. Okay, so now if we look to, so now let's look, we've got nodes five and six, which have a cost of five and six respectively. Um, five plus, and neither of those will add any th information, right? We'll look at five first, but five plus four gives us nine, which is not cheaper than six. And then finally, six doesn't add, node six doesn't add any extra edges, so we're done here. All right, so this was a much better graph than the other one. Um, and generally, right, if the professor's using two-digit numbers for edges that aren't 10, he's being mean. So, um, so and list the or vertices in the order they're processed by the algorithm. Well, I just happened to do that. You visit one, two, four, three, five, six. All right. So if V is the number of vertices in the directed graph and E is the number of edges, what is the running uh, the running time uh, for Dijkstra's algorithm in big O notation? Well, that depends on how you do it, and I've been doing it the way Dijkstra did it, which was not optimized. The current optimized way to do that is. Um, is Dijkstra, let's look at Dijkstra's algorithm. And by the way, if you're still having trouble with this, take a look at the uh, Crash Course video on algorithms. So like Crash Course Computer, so just look on YouTube, Crash Course Computer Science. 
algorithms, and it has a very good and I th it has a nice animation of the way uh, Dijkstra's algorithm is being is performed. But we look at this. The worst case performance for this, if you use something called a Fib Fibonacci heap, which is a special type of heap, um, the worst case performance is edge, the number of edges plus v log v. But the way we've been learning it is the way the original algorithm does it, which is well. Let's go ahead and see if there if we have the algorithm over here. Um, we initialize all the vertices, which takes, and all the edges, which takes OV time. And then what we do is that we, um, while the queue is not empty, so this is, so, so now we're in the main loop. While the queue isn't empty, we find the vertice with the, with the minimum distance. So this over here takes O of V time, okay? At least when we're using a, at least the way we've been doing it, which is going through this list of nodes over here, right? We have to look at every node in that that's we still have in to do and figure out which of them has the shortest distance. If we were using a special data structure like this Fibonacci heap, we might be able, we can do it in cheaper time. But right over here, this take is taking us ob time. Now, how many times do we have to do this operation? Well, every node is 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 in the unvisited set to begin with, right? So we do this, find the shortest distance for every node in here. So that is O of V times O of V for grand total of V squared. So it takes V squared operations. Um, and then we don't have to bother worrying about how many edges there are because the worst case scenario for the number of edges is V squared, right? So even if it was O of V squared plus O of E squared, Sorry, O of V squared plus O of E, right? Because we do check all the edges. Well, the maximum number of edges is O of V squared. So that would still be O of V squared. So it's all O of V squared because this main loop, right? Uh, because of this main loop we go through. This is saying this is a loop that runs O of V time, and this operation over here runs O of V. And then we don't have to bother factoring in our edges because the maximum number of edges is O of V squared. So that would just simply be adding two things of the same magnitude. Um, so Dijkstra's algorithm is fairly slow as done, but you can, but when you've got a min priority queue that uses this Fibonacci heap, which is um, black magic essentially, it works out pretty well. Um, so let's go on to the next um, data. Let's see. So next one, topological sort. So quick sort's worst case runtime is O of n squared, but it has an expected runtime of n log n, right? The average case scenario for it for quicksort is n log n. What needs to be true about the partition function in order for the running time to be n log n? And in practice, how can we ensure that this happens? So when do we get O of n squared for quicksort? What causes quicksort to get to to get that O of n squared runtime? Yeah, whenever whenever time whenever we get bad we have bad luck choosing a pivot, and then that causes us to have bad luck choosing the next pivot, and so on and so forth, right? Choosing one bad pivot isn't a, isn't a deal breaker necessarily, but after you choose it a lot of times, right? If every time we choose the, a pivot poorly, like we choose the biggest item or the smallest item, so that's, remain, that's remaining, then that will cause us to have O of n squared, because each iteration we're only ever sorting one item. So what needs to be true about the partition function. It needs to select an item that's, so So when we have, we need, yes? Right, but to get make sure that's n log n, we want what? Mm -hmm. We want the median. We want the median value. Now, there's ways to find a median value quickly, um, but we can also just like do we can also do it what we did with uh, our 
Um, what we learned, what our textbook described was like a quick way to just kind of pick something that's median-ish, right? Where we would just take the first, last, and middle values of the array and figure and just use the median of those three values. And that generally just helps make sure that we never ever choose the, wor the worst possible choice. Um, so, so in practice, how can we, sh uh, can we ensure this happens? By rigging the pivot value in constant time, essentially. By, choosing, by making sure that we choose values that are closer to the median. All right, so, um, so let's close. And that's that one. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's pretty straight, uh, that's pretty good for all these. So now let's, let me just go ahead and see this page. I think we went over the insertion sort versus merge sort, right? The worst case scenarios? No? We didn't get to that in this class? Okay. Let's go over another sorting question then. So let's consider merge sort, insertion sort versus merge sort. For each algorithm, what is the worst case asymptotic upper bound for the running time if you know additionally that? So asymptotic, what's the worst case scenario? Right? What is the worst case runtime? Uh, and the reason it's worded like this in more mathematics is, is because it's an algorithms and data structures class versus data structures, right? So, um, for each, so what is the uh, asymptotic upper bound if you initially know that the input is already sorted, it's reversely sorted, or, it's a, or the entire list is like the same number, right? How does insertion sort and merge sort um, Compare. For each case and each sorting algorithm, state your answer and justify it in one sentence. All right. Well, okay. For insertion sort, let's take a look. Uh, what is the wor how is this going to perform in the worst case? If, if insertion sort is given in a, set of, a list of numbers or an array of numbers that's already sorted. Yes? That is actually the best case scenario for insertion sort, right? Because there's no items to move around. There's no items it needs to swap. It checks each item and goes, I don't need to move this item. I don't need to push it down. I don't need to insert it into the sorted section. It just goes on to the end of the sorted section, right? And it just keeps doing that for every item. And so it takes O of n time, right? However, if the array is reversely sorted, what's that mean? That's O of n squared is actually, when it's reversely sorted, that's pretty much for every single uh, sorting algorithm that is the utter worst case scenario, right? Because first item's fine for insertion sort, but then it, we get, so say we've got, it's one, two, three, four, five. So, so, so let's say our numbers, ha sorry, let's say that our array is five, four, three, two, one, okay? We insert the five, fantastic. Oh, now we got to insert four, so we swap with five. So now we have five, four. So now we got to insert three. We'll swap the three with the five, swap the three with the four. So swap it with the, that's hard when I'm trying to do it. Yeah, so we swap it with the five, then swap it with the four, so now it's three, four, five. Then we've got two. Well, we need to insert two, so swap it with the two, swap it with the four, swap it with the three. So then we're in the right place. Then we got to insert the one, so over the five, four, three, two. So every item, so we have to swap one item, then two items, and three items, and four items, and five items, and all the way up to n items. So that is O of n squared uh, swaps and comparisons. Yes? Got that last bit. What? Got that last bit. The live one? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I did put it in to my. Um, I'm three minutes over. Okay. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. You're fantastic. Um, so the input is reversely sorted. Now, what if the input is a list containing n copies of the same item, uh, same number? And I'm going to go ahead and assume that the list is size n, right? So what happens if it's all the same number? It's already sorted, right? It's, re it's already sorted, right? If it's all the same numbers and all the numbers are in order. Fantastic. C, C answer to problem to, to A. Now for merge sort, Honestly, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, what's, the Im what's the input time if it's already sorted for, for merge sort? N log, n log n. What's the worst case scenario for if it's reversely sorted? N log n. n, log n. What if it's all the same number? N log n. 
Why is this? Because merge sort doesn't care about the ordering of the items. It always runs an n log n time because it has to break it apart into halves and break those halves into halves and those halves into halves and then merge them back together, which takes n log n time. Doesn't matter what the numbers are in the list. It will all the the merge sort algorithm always runs in the same uh, number of steps, no matter what. Very predictable, which is why it's very desirable. Okay, and we went over this hash table problem, I believe, right? Yep. So that that's what it was. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Suppose you. Ha let's see. Suppose that we first insert an element in x into a binary search tree that does not already have x. Suppose that we immediately delete x from the tree. Will the new tree be identical to the original one? So we insert an item into the binary search tree. We then remove the item to, from the binary search tree. Will the new tree be identical to the original? If yes, give the reason in no more than three sentences. If no, give the counterexample and draw pictures if necessary. So if we're inserting an item into a binary search tree, where does the bin where does the item end up? And where do, where where do items end up in a, when you insert them in a binary search? It's a leaf. Okay? So I mean, whenever we add an item, it's going to end up as a leaf. Guaranteed, especially if it doesn't already contain the item already. So we don't have to worry about the a weird case like that. If it doesn't already contain the item, then guaranteed that node is ending up as a leaf. Okay, now suppose we now delete, you know, we meet, we added it. There's no intermediate operations between this, right? The lines are add x, delete x. Okay, now we immediately delete it. Is the new tree going to be identical? Sorry, is the sorry is the resulting tree going to be identical as before? And I'm seeing some nods, and the reason is because if we're deleting it, then we're deleting it from, of uh, where if we're deleting that item, we're deleting a leaf which just simply means you just kind of just trim it off. It doesn't adjust anything. So that's our answer there. And you can kind of draw that with basically saying, um, you know, I could draw that pretty easily saying that, you know, something like this. Like, here's our initial tree. Right, and then I'll hang this out over here just to show that it's a leaf. Right, so step one, or rather I'll do step one, step two, right? Now we go to delete it, right? And then we're back to our original tree, right? We're back to our original structure. By the, by the fact that we added, we added this thing over here, it's now a leaf. We delete a leaf, which, take, which basically is, a, is the simplest case that we hope to get when we do a delete operation, right? It's fairly straightforward. I've always wondered if that's a trick question because I can't find a counterexample. And if you happen to find a counterexample, then please let me know. Uh, the only counterexample I can possibly think of is that if it's not a binary search tree but a self-balancing binary search tree. And in that case, it could, of course, restructure itself, right? And when it restructures it, and then you delete it, it might not necessarily be the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see. Suppose we haven't looked at this problem before. Suppose we have a heap and we have two values, one and two, such that all and such that all the values are in this heap are distinct. Let heap one, two be the heap you get when you insert one and two in the heap. And two, one be the heap if you insert v2 and then v1 into the heap. Give an example of, of, of eight of the heap, values one and two, such that h1 is not equal to h, h12 is not equal to two, one. No justification needed, just draw the, heap, the original heap then one, two, and two, one. In other words, we have two values. Let's add them into the heap and show that if we add them in different orders, we get two differently shaped, sorry, two differently, two different heaps with two different values, two heaps that aren't identical. So we need to come up with a, um, an I, I, 
idea for that. So let's go ahead and just choose, I'm going to arbitrarily choose values that are really big and a really big value and a really small value, right? Because that's the least confusing thing I can do, I feel. Um, but honestly, but honestly, it's not that hard. I could, let's do, let's, let's work with the min heap, right? So our, my initial heap is going to be a zero, right over here. I'm gonna do zero as my initial heap. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and then it says draw, let one, two be the heap if you insert V1 and then V2 into the heap. So I'm just starting out with a heap of zero. So I'm gonna insert one and a thousand. Okay, then I'm gonna insert a thousand and then one, it's a different heap. Okay, not too high. I mean, this is what I'm pretty sure this guy is going for. They're not, e the, these two heaps are not equal. They have different, the left child and right child are different, right? Because all that matters is that the smallest item is at top of the heap, right? Um, mind you, it's, the question is much easier when he tells you that it is that this is a possibility, right? So you aren't left with self-doubt. Um, suppose you have a graph like this one below. Okay, the dots signify some part of a graph that you don't know ex that you don't know exactly. It's not a straight link, right? There's not a straight link from start to goal. Okay, you know that there are many paths from your start to your goal. You also know they tend to be rather long. Suppose you want to implement a program that searches for a path and returns the first one it can find. You have no needs for finding the optimal path in any sense. Just find a path from start to goal. You know one exists. We, uh, you want to use, would you want to use breadth research or depth research for your program? Justify your answer in at most two sentences. Do we want to use breadth research or depth research for that? So, um, so let's think. Breath first. So, so depth first. Let's think. Consider what happens with depth first, right? With depth first, I can go and go this way. Then I can choose a node and, uh, and go this way, and then this way, and then this way, and this way, and then this way, this way, this way, and basically wind my way back and forth between all the different connections. Depth first might basically because I have to explore all a a path all the way. I could get very lucky and go boom, 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 right like that and find it in five steps. Or I could get very unlikely and wind all over the way of the graph. So I probably wouldn't want to use depth first. I, breadth first, on the other hand, I'll do one away, then all the nodes two away, all the nodes three, and then that will get rather long actually. So they're both actually kind of terrible because breadth first I have to basically, breadth first will be pretty exhaustive. It will get me there to the end. It's kind of, breadth first would be kind of like you know, and again, it's like solving a maze, um, what we're really asking to do. And this is more like a maze than depth first might work. But since we know where our goal is, actually, one thing that I've often heard as a good answer, so I think basically that this is more of a justification thing rather than a what's the right one. However, I would say that what I would do was use breadth first search, but I'd do it. Uh, I, but I do basically a modified version where I'd start from both the start and the goal. So I'd visit starts neighbors and then goals neighbors and then see if I've got an intersection, right? Then from here and then here and then see if I've got an intersection and then from here and here and see if the three neighbors have an intersection. So it would cost about the amount of going three steps in twice, but that would be cheaper than going six steps, you know. So doing a two-way uh, especially if there are also edges going this way, this way, this way. That also depends. Does the start only have edges going out and no goal has other edges going in? This has a lot of questions for it. I actually think this is a fairly decent warm question for, for like warming up on an interview because honestly, they both have terrible approaches. If this is most like a maze though, and all these paths work, then I guess a depth first search would work. If, all, if we assume all these, it, it really depends on the interpretation of a problem. You do know that there are many paths from the start to a goal. That's something to look up, I would say, because I will admit I don't actually know the answer to that one.
All right, so it is what time? So it is 1147.